Great. Well, we have lots of people who are still joining us. So hello, welcome everyone um, who, is, who is still arriving. Um, but I'm going to get us started for the evening. So good evening. My name is Arielle Cates. I'm the Director of Programming at Village Preservation. I'm so glad that you're all here with us for what I know will be an inspiring, wild, musical, and wonderful evening celebrating and learning about all things Judson Memorial Church. Um, a quick bit about Village Preservation. We have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We host roughly 75 programs a year, all of which are now virtual and most of which are free and open to the public. Our events are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage, history and depth and the value of preservation in our communities. We are, we are a nonprofit membership-based organization, so your involvement and support mean the world to us. You can learn more at our wonderful new website, villagepreservation.org, and please consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able at villagepreservation.org slash donate. So just a bit of Zoom protocol, though I won't be visible during the event, please feel free to use the chat to say hi, tell me where you're joining from, and to raise any issues or thoughts. We're not going to take questions at the end of this evening's event, but if you have questions, feel free to ask them, and I can try to answer or else pass them on to the wonderful folks at Judson. So I am very pleased to introduce our MC for this evening. Reverend Micah Busey serves as minister at Judson Memorial Church, a congregation committed to curiously seeking the intersections between spirituality, justice, and creativity. He developed and continues to oversee Judson's weekly and completely free Judson Arts Wednesdays series, which has commissioned, presented, produced, and promoted the creative output of hundreds of poets, actors, playwrights, composers, musicians, dancers, choreographers, painters, photographers, sculptors, and many others from New York City and beyond. I'm also going to put information about all of our panelists this evening in the chat so that you can learn more about everyone and their work. So thanks again so much to all of you. And Micah, take us away. Thank you so much, Arielle, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Ariel. As Ariel said, my name is Micah, and I have the deep honor of currently serving as one of the ministers of Judson Memorial Church. And in addition to my title of minister, I am also a true, unabashed, card-carrying fangirl of the continuing history of this place, these people, and this legacy of embodied sanctuary. So it would be putting it lightly to say that I am positively amped to share this awesome evening of storytelling and creative offerings with all of you. And you are about to experience a kooky collage of creativity as only Judson could create it. You will hear from activists, artists, artivists, organizers, and faith leaders, a truly heavenly tapestry of holy troublemakers. But before I get carried away with the faithful fun, at all of Judson's Sunday morning services, we begin with an acknowledgement of the first peoples, the first stewards of the land on which Judson's physical sanctuary currently stands. So now, as we prepare to talk about how we have been stewards, how we are stewards, and how we can be better stewards for one another, I invite you to give attention to Judson's land acknowledgement. So to prepare, let's just take a deep breath in together and let it out. Judson's physical sanctuary stands on the unceded land of the Lenape people. Judson Memorial Church acknowledges the Lenape community their elders both past and present, as well as future generations, and we make this acknowledgement as part of our work 
to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, Christian supremacy, and white supremacy. Thank you. So, sanctuary. It's a word we hear uttered so often these days by those who claim it, those who deride it, those who politicize it, those who have no idea what it means, and the word has deep ancient roots, starting with the Latin word sanctus, meaning holy. And church people often think of sanctuary as a physical space, a place of safety, of worship, of community, of sacred, holy activity and practice. But how often do you think about embodying sanctuary? carrying sanctuary around with you, becoming a sanctuary in everything you do. Well, the folks at Judson Memorial Church have been embodying sanctuary for as long as they've had a physical one. We always end our worship services by saying, this service is ending, but our service in the world continues. And it's a reminder to embody sanctuary, especially after you've left the physical sanctuary. And since its inception, Judson has sought to continually expand the meaning of that word sanctuary with its 132-year-old landmarked building serving as a safe haven for artists, immigrants, and unfettered innovation in the realms of spirituality, justice-making, and creativity. And now, as the definition of sanctuary is degraded by politicians, disrespected by government agencies, and cheapened by overuse, we have gathered here tonight to talk about what it means to not only think of sanctuary as a physical place, but as an active embodied state of being. And for over 13 decades at Judson, sanctuary has been embodied as accompanying immigrants, elevating uncensored art, spreading radical hope instead of harmful ideology, connecting women to safe abortions, fostering radical relationship with sex workers, educating consumers on their healthcare choices, occupying public spaces in the fight for economic justice, creating safe space for protesters, organizers, and activists, building multi-faith bridges in order to create epically essential new forms of ritual, tending to the dying, the degraded, and the determined when the world turned its back on AIDS, committing to harm reduction and refusing to stigmatize people who use drugs, celebrating queerness in all its myriad beauty, looking to the margins to see who is being left out, who needs to claim their space, who can teach us more about ourselves and our untapped collective potential. So if you're wondering what embodying sanctuary even means, you've come to the right place because we have some vibrant voices to give us all the various possibilities. Judson is 13 decades old, and there are countless ways for us to continue to push ourselves to embody sanctuary even more radically. We're just getting started. And speaking of getting started, we are going to begin with an invigorating crash course through all of this history presented by one of Judson's beloved archivists, Abigail Hastings. And the first Sunday Abigail visited Judson was in January 1978, the first Sunday that beloved minister and composer Al Carmines was back from his aneurysm healing, and Arlene Carmen had been swept up the night before in an arrest of prostitutes. Cabaret star Margaret Wright sang, a good man is hard to find, and they passed around champagne. And Abigail said, this is the church for me. So embodying sanctuary can mean finding and co-creating the right place for you. So show us how, Abigail. Are we hearing the recording? Nope. No. Christine? Go ahead, Abigail, we can hear you. I think Christine has the recording though. 
Christine, you might have to unshare and reshare with the video tick boxes. Isn't live theater wonderful? <laughs> this is amazing. We're co-creating it together. <laughs> in history. It begins with Adoniram Judson, one of the first foreign missionaries who died after 37 years in Burma. His son, Edward, bereft over the loss of his parents, wondered why they couldn't have ministered here just as well. His famous father had died at sea with no marker, so Edward imagined a great memorial church to honor him. He imagined the perfect place for this memorial church, the south side of Washington Square, where the rich of Fifth Avenue could come and minister to the poor of the South Village. And poor they were, as was being seen at the time in Jacob Reese's photos. Edward imagined a sanctuary from the squalor, a place that would lift their spirits with the finest appointments possible architecture by Stanford White, stained glass by John Lafarge, marble angels by Herbert Adams. The design was purposefully fashioned after Romanesque architecture to be welcoming to the Italian immigrants. Soon the lighted cross became an anchor to the south side of the park and is said to have guided many a late night reveler home. Edward created what he called the institutional church. He said, if a business firm should erect an expensive building and use it only during six or seven hours a week, could it expect to succeed? He devised programs to keep the place jumping all hours of the day, every day. The church property took up most of the block and provided English, sewing and cooking classes, clubs and music and healthcare which evolved into one of the first healthcare clinics in the country, led by Dr. Eleanor Campbell. Three water fountains surrounded the church, giving clean, cold water to many who had none. Children with rickets were on the roof to get sunshine. But the impetus for all this was in part towards what was called Christian Americanization. The caption here reads, an American will emerge from each cocoon. The Fifth Avenue crowd never really embraced Judson. There were lean years when we lost the tower and adjacent property to NYU. During the Great Depression, homeless men slept on the pews. As the city started to come back, so did Judson. Post-war theology brought an experiment in high church with the addition of the cross and pulpit, a big departure from our low Baptist style. In 1956, an ex-Marine Southern Baptist from Texas took the pastorate. Howard Moody came with a set of Baptist principles that inform everything that followed. Make no mistake, the church may not have pews with slots for Bibles, but everything that happens here comes from deep theological roots. It's a belief in what we call soul freedom or soul competency that no one stands between you and God. And the autonomy of the local church. That translated for Howard into no censorship in the arts and the freedom to explore where other churches fear to tread. In 1957, Howard invited Mahalia Jackson to sing to an overflow crowd. In 1959, he became president of the Village Independent Democrats because he knew lasting change comes through public policy. When folk singers were being run out of the park in 1961, Judson opened the doors to them. Soon thereafter, the Judson Mod Squad of a staff, Arlene Carmen, Al Carmines, and Howard started getting into all kinds of good trouble. 
Arlene helped with the abortion project and later with working women and the AIDS crisis. In the late 1950s, the Judson Gallery opened as a hospitality center for a revolution in the visual arts. It was for emerging artists who couldn't show their work elsewhere. Al was tasked to continue this work of finding out what artists need, which was simply enough, a place to show their art. Judson became a sanctuary for the arts because of the freedom given to the artists, including Al Carmine's, who created award-winning off-off Broadway oratorios. Like most churches, Judson originally had pews, but we soon learned it was better for dancers to have the open space. The Judson Dance Theater became pivotal in dance history as the birthplace of postmodern dance. The 1970 flag show married art, dance, and political protest. The arts have continued to be foundational to Judson's identity as it informs our worship and inspires us. We believe artists to be modern day prophets. Free theater, music, and dance are performed on Wednesday nights with a free meal. And the gym at Judson is a theater for full productions. While Judson was landmarked in 1966, preservationists might be interested to know how many times we came close to losing the building. There were plans to make Judson the NYU Protestant Center, a companion to the Catholic Center across the street. Now, as November light shines on us, as it did in Edward Hopper's painting, much has grown up around us, but we're still here with the right people at the right time. And as you can tell, with a great deal of love for what the artists call the Judson. Wow. 132 years. The story of Judson. Minutes. That is a feat. So thank you, Abigail. And now, we're going to start to dig even deeper into some of these moments in Judson's history. So next up is Art Levin, who spent three decades involved at the core and at the edges of Judson's secular, social, and artistic life. And through his work at the Center for Medical Consumers, founded at Judson, Art served on a number of national and New York State programs focused on consumer information, the quality of care, and the rights of patients to make informed decisions about their health and health care. He's here to tell you all about it. So embodying sanctuary can mean assuring informed health care choices for all. So show us how, Art. So um, thanks. Um, in the late 1960s, I was looking around for what I would do next after our family business was sold. And I knew Howard Moody from reform democratic politics in the village. And somebody suggested I talk to him about uh, maybe finding something to do of, of, that was useful. And um, we met and talked about a lot of advocacy programs for the underserved populations in the village, things most churches wouldn't touch. 10 years before the church had worked with young drug users, many from the Italian American community south of Washington Square Park and was among the first uh, in the city to offer them uh, treatment programs rather than jail time. The 1960s saw a rise in the number of teenage runaways and throwaways uh, flocking to the village. So in June 1968, we opened the Judson House for runaways in what was um, the uh, former student, student house. It was the first of its kind outside of Huckleberry House, which was in Hate Ashbury in San Francisco. Some of these programs like the Runaway House were quite literally sanctuary projects. Others were more metaphorical, but still a refuge. Among them were these projects. The Judson Teenage Arts Workshop, the first um, project I did at Judson. Uh, in those days, the village was inundated with um, swarms of teenagers, most evenings and on weekends. There was little legal for them to do since they were all underage, couldn't go to the clubs uh, or bars. And to, to provide service to that population, 
we rented a storefront on West Third, hired six of the Judson artists, and had free workshops for teenagers um, every night of the week and on weekends. Another project we started was the Judson Mobile Health Clinic. This was a clinic that was set up in a uh, construction trailer and moved around the Lower East Side and East Village about every two or three months to another location. Um, teenagers in particular weren't willing to seek service from uh, traditional providers because if they needed treatment, um, their parents needed to be advised so they could give consent. And um, they really were afraid that one of the things that would happen is they'd be sent back home. Center for Reproductive and Sexual Health, or CRASH, strange acronym. Uh, in 1970, when the abortion when abortion was made legal in New York State, sort of a big surprise to us all, passed by one vote, um, we opened the um, first legalized, recognized um, abortion facility in New York State it was recognized by the state health department. Uh, and, and approved, and um, it, it served tens of thousands of women who were referred by clergy working through the clergy consultation service. In 1973, when Roe v. Wade made abortion legal, the church decided to keep the clinic going, and, but to sort of redirect it to serve mostly low-income uh, women who needed services and to keep prices low, and quality high. The prostitution project you've heard mentioned, um, and you know Howard and Arlene, that was their baby. I really had nothing to do with it. You see the bus, that was a famous bus that parked itself in Times Square and other areas where working women were and offered refuge from bad weather and a place to socialize and a place to get advice about services that were needed. Early in the AIDS epidemic, without any visible approved therapies, and HIV AIDS was basically a death sentence for most of those who um, had been diagnosed, um, we were approached by some AIDS advocates about being a place where some promising uh, alternative unrecognized treatments could be uh, tried out, could be experimented with. And we agreed to do it. And so for a period of time, uh, we served uh, a number of people who were volunteers with HIV AIDS and we had volunteer doctors and specialists as well, um, giving people alternative treatments that they couldn't get any other way. And the last big project, which was already mentioned, um, came about because Howard and I sort of was simultaneously reading a lot of um, literature, including uh, Medical Nemesis by Ivan Illich and a book by Rick Carlson called End of Medicine. Uh, and we began to appreciate the fact that um, US healthcare was really uh, very limited and insular and uh, basically unwilling to share important information to allow people to make informed decisions about their own healthcare. So we founded something called the Center for Medical Consumers in 1976, um, the center featured a free medical library, uh, not with lay books, with medical books and lay books um, that was open free to the public five days a week. And um, we published a, a newsletter called Health Facts, which was written and edited by my friend and colleague, Marianne Napoli. Um, the center continued to operate at Judson until it moved on uh, to uh, an online entity, sort of virtual like we all are now. And um, it eventually ceased operation completely in the late 1990s. It was time because strangely enough, the medical establishment began to recognize the importance of patient and provider choice, which, was, which required uh, patient and providers understanding the benefits and risks of medical care and making wise decisions. So. That, that tradition sort of been carried on uh, and, and there was really no need for the center anymore. So that was sort of the last of the big projects that 
was born at, at, at Judson and, and continued at Judson. But all of these discrete projects aside, we always knew that lasting change for the greatest number of people had to come about with better informed public policy and better engagement. And I think we contributed to that over the years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Art. And now from healthcare to heart care, it's time to talk about uncensored art at Judson. And at Judson, we've always believed that artists have the potential to serve as our modern day prophets. They show us where we've been, they show us who we are, and they show us what we can become. And photographer Peter Moore captured many of the most creative and daring artistic happenings at Judson in the 1960s, photographing the Hall of Issues, Judson Dance Theater, and Judson Poets Theater. And his partner, Barbara, is here to share some of his visions. And Barbara Moore is an art historian, a writer, and the director of the Peter Moore Photography Archives. An embodying sanctuary can mean unfettered artistic expression. So show us how, Barbara and Peter. My name is Barbara Moore, and I'm the director of the Peter Moore Photography Archive. I have an association with Judson going back almost 60 years. Some of you may know of Peter's work through his photographs of Judson Dance Theater. One of Peter's earliest photographs is of the ancient door to Judson's main space, the meeting room with its original name and primary purpose sanctuary written on the glass. Peter and I first encountered Judson in 1961 when we attended a play by his friend, Bill Packard. It was appropriately titled in the first place and it began what became known as the Judson Poets Theater. In all, over three decades, Peter photographed more than 120 Judson events and activities. That's an awful lot of sanctuary. In addition to the dance and poets theaters, this included original ways of community outreach, such as the Hall of Issues, where anyone could post anything for discussion. Judson also supported free expression in other ways. Here's Reverend Howard Moody introducing the band film, The Connection. Other things that Peter photographed and that we attended were gallery exhibitions, including early ones by Eva Hess and Yoko Ono, Peter Schumann's Bread and Puppet Theater, poetry readings, holiday events, services, agape meals, coffee hours, the student house, lectures, discussions, and symposia, weddings, memorials, song fests, and ordinations. Peter and I weren't the only ones who discovered and who continue to discover sanctuary at Judson. The artists were a big part of that, and they always came through with extraordinary events. Also, here's a typical night at the theater uh, with a huge crowd, as always. And personally, for me, as a side note, after I chose this photograph for my presentation, I realized that pictured about three quarters of the way to the left side, wearing a print dress, is Eileen Pasloff a Judson dancer who also retained a career-long association with Judson and who I'd like to play homage to right now uh, because she passed away about two weeks ago. Thank you so much, Barbara and Peter. And thank you, Barbara, for bringing Eileen Pasloff into this space with us tonight. We just lost Eileen in the past month. So thank you for bringing her into this space and thank you for sharing that wonderful history and those wonderful photographs. And this commitment to art and artists continues to this day. 
with Judson's free food and free art program, Judson Arts Wednesdays, which has fed thousands and developed the work of hundreds of artists over the past decade, all in deep honor of the countless artists who came before us. So next up is Nia Calloway, one of our most beloved jaw artists in residency, and she'll be sharing her embodiment of sanctuary through her original poetry, music, and movement. And she says she dearly misses exploring her movement language in a dance studio. However, the gift of movement within Mother Nature and explorational movement in general has served as a loving sanctuary for her during quarantine. So embodying sanctuary can mean taking the creative gifts of your ancestors and claiming your own creative space. So show us how, Nia. Sanctuary, sanctuary, I am sanctuary, I embody sanctuary because I embody a prayer for the future, I embody the beauty, grace, nourishment, and love the future possesses, I embody sanctuary because I am my own rocket ship flying back home, feel God in the subtle and stealthy quiets, right at the apex of a night breeze's deep inhale, there I am sanctified. Eyes wider than my sugary brown legs, eyes red like the blood flowing between them, singing to and from both mountaintops. I pray with open fists, fingers outstretched, banging repeatedly on my own church bell. I bang repeatedly, declaring my irreverence to an entire world's slumber. I shall no longer sleep on the pleasure I deserve, for it will only manifest in my dreams, only to be ensnared and enjoyed in the next lifetime. Hallelujah. Oya, oya, ashe. Happy Eya, what a goddess. To have found home in myself is a blessing. To feel my flesh as sanctuary, as sensual, as the big, greedy, juicy organ that it is, is my birthright. I bathe in the western breeze as it presents me with gifts of the southern sky. I am whole again. Sanctified in a gory glory, bound to repeat history, to cycle back into myself once again. I embody a sanctuary free of limits, free of impossibilities, free of doubts baking into my skin like the Texas summer sun. I embody a becoming, a reckoning of grace, and a becoming of liberation. Liberation fine-tuned in my Black femme imagination. I am neither beast nor burden. I am not broken. I am sanctuary, sitting, sitting, sitting. For a wet dream. So, and this warm water is my new reality. Drenched with desire for more of me, more of God, more of this living, breathing, fleshy sanctuary I call home. This sanctuary does not serve to divide, for it is the very antithesis of barriers. This sanctuary is a deluge of love, of grace, of communion, of matter, mattering. I matter, I am a mattering. Meanwhile, making matters more mesmerizing, more memorable. Yes, Ashe, I sit, I sit, I sit today, and I am sanctuary. Take all my love, take all my sins, take all my tragedies, take all my triumphs and wins. This is where my sacred healing begins.
Thank you so much, Nia, so gorgeous. And you can't continue to talk about creativity at Judson without bringing in our decades long history of creating radical relationship with sex workers, activists and artivists. So next up, we're going to hear about this continuing history from Dr. Veronica Vera Cottingham, a Judson member, a sex workers rights activist, an author, and the founder of Miss Vera's Finishing School for Boys Who Want to Be Girls, the world's first transgender academy. So embodying sanctuary can mean rising above the classic puritanical trappings of traditional church and indulging in some sacred pleasure. So show us how, Veronica. Uh, <laughs> I love Judson because it's an all welcoming sex positive environment. As a human being, a woman, an artist and an activist or an artivist, that nourishing environment is essential to me. Being sex positive means that our sexuality is a path to explore, not something to be feared. When I was in grammar school, I used to write flowery paragraphs about the Blessed Virgin and I got lots of praise. A little later, I decided to write about a, a supposed whorehouse in our town and I got no praise for that. My mother read my notes and she was terrified. But I was very curious. I wondered how a woman could have sex with man after man. And my curiosity really led me to explore my own sexuality and find out my own answers and explore it, I did. Throughout the 80s, I did exhaustive research as a high-heeled journalist. Times Square was my beat. I even made a few hardcore movies. I was a porn star. I learned a lot, and I learned that I didn't have to beat myself up with guilt because I don't believe the same rules as my parents to prove that I love them. For the past 30 years since founding Miss Vera's Finishing School, I was, have been able to pass that le lesson on to my adult students. Judson is a sanctuary for my art. It makes speaking my truth a sacred endeavor Take that word sacred and switch the letters around and you get scared. Within the sanctuary of Judson and the Judson community, I'm not scared, I am sacred. Judson supported sex workers' rights long before I came here. I met Arlene Carmen in the 80s when Judson gave us room to hold pony meetings, prostitutes of New York, the sex workers' rights organization. I now organize annual the annual, I now organize annual visits, vigils in honor of D17, the international day to remember sex workers who've died of violence. Treats and support are supplied by the same cookie brigade that made them for the Judson bus that you've seen throughout this show. The bus that drove through Times Square in the late seventies where Arlene Carmen offered warmth to street walkers. A big gap followed then for a while. I wasn't coming to Judson. I never really came regularly until 2012 when my husband Stu and I came here for our wedding. We were very welcomed. Stu loved coming to Judson. When Stu died just one year later from a shocking brain tumor, we held his memorial celebration here. We also celebrated the lives of my Club 90 porn star sisters, Gloria Leonard and Candida Royale, who were all my bridesmaids, among my bridesmaids at the wedding. One day, an idea from Reverend Donna to remind tired activists that pleasure is important evolved into Pleasure Activist Sunday. When, with great aid from my bosom buddy, Annie Sprinkle, I involved the erotic artists, educators, and entrepreneurs who are my friends. I loved having my Judson community meet my sex world community. It was great watching them serve each other and, and activate, act together, and the bartenders being one was an ex porn star and one was a Judson uh, very. Well, it was Craig. <laughs> so I, I love that meeting and it was a festive event. 
At Candida's memorial in 2015, Judson had connected with HBO's The Deuce, and the uh, Times Square bus was recreated and featured in two episodes of The Deuce. Maggie Gyllenhaal, with members of the cast and crew, began attending the December 17th vigils. I tell folks, it's great to have a church at my back. I believe in the world Judson stands for, and together we help create it. This is an artistic process. Membership in Judson is a sexy, dynamic collaboration. Thank you so much, Veronica. And of course, Judson sanctuary history hasn't just been about pleasure. In the 1960s, prior to the Roe v. Wade decision, Judson and its partners noticed a painful trend of women needing access to safe abortions without the traditional pastoral tendency to try to talk them out of those abortions. And with this knowledge, and with the spirit on Judson's side and responding to this reality, Judson helped to initiate the clergy consultative service on abortion. And here to give us some of that history is Judson's current senior minister, Reverend Dr. Donna Scopper, who has served Judson since 2005. And Donna is one of the founders of the New, City, New York City's New Sanctuary Coalition and of Bricks and Mortals, an organization designed to preserve religious institutions and teach them to thrive in new ways. And her life's goal is to provide spiritual nurture for public capacity. So embodying sanctuary can mean allowing women agency over their own bodies and accompanying them through it all. Show us how, Donna. Donna, you need to unmute. Here we go. It started with a woman who had what others call a problem pregnancy, and it ended with a law. In 1973, Roe dueled with Wade and women won. We are our own rocket ships. Three years ago, when we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the clergy consultation service on abortion, we were more than a little self-congratulatory. We were so proud of what we had done to assure health rights for women that we almost forgot for one night how threatened these rights continue to be. Howard Moody, our former pastor, a Marine with a flat top, a person who didn't have to care about women or the kind of subjugation our bodies continue to receive. A Baptist minister from the South, Howard decided to care. He didn't have to. Along with 20 other clergy and rabbis, they helped women find safe abortions for six years before it was legalized nationwide. I was a part of the national CCS while a graduate student in Chicago at the University of Chicago Divinity School. I enjoyed my first arrest through that internship. The police thought we were performing abortions in the basement of Rockefeller Chapel. We weren't, although that day could still come. We made sure the abortion providers were respectful, competent, and didn't extort money from women. Clergy consultation probably made more people safe than any other ministry or activity Judson has ever had. And by the way, we have not been inconsequential. These days, we go one more step in sanctuary. We see in Judson's involvement a through line. Call it human rights or call it the humanization of the outsider, the immigrant, the prostitute, the woman who forgot her birth control for the night, that bad girl, that bad immigrant, or call it sanctuary, which is not, not just as it used to be in the first centuries, housing a horse thief for a moment, but preparing for his release so that he can go and sin no more, or at least a little less, whatever sin is. Yes, 
sanctuary thousands of years ago began as a place where you could go when you had stolen a horse and were in deep trouble. Augustine loved it. These last decades, it has become a place where you could organize a church or a synagogue or a religious institution to take the place of the oppressed. We say, take us instead of them. Take us instead of her. The church where sanctuaries practice left the building and went to the Supreme Court. It went to Federal Plaza. It went to doctor's offices and got into their billing practices. Just a moment about the history of sanctuary, if you don't mind. I borrow all of this from Ail Kroll Zaid, a historian of sanctuary. His, their conclusion is what matters to our moment. Quote, sanctuary today is defined by the way it draws strength from the church membership. It is a profoundly participatory phenomenon. And today congregants routinely say that it is they who have been saved and succored by the work of protecting strangers or the strange. In quotes, the Reverend William Sloan Coffin Jr. once put it, less a means to shield a man, more a means to expose a church, to make a church really a church. Sanctuary now does something that St. Augustine never envisioned. It allows the church to be the so-called presumed guilty party. This kind of work is never only, only just well begun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. And leaving the building and embodying accompaniment has been a part of embodied sanctuary at Judson since its beginnings. And in the 1980s and 90s, new need reared its head as AIDS ravaged queer communities and other communities and many churches closed their doors in response. And Judson responded through programs like the AIDS Resource Center, what eventually became Bailey House, and through our continuing work in harm reduction in the form of the Harm Reduction Family Love Feast facilitated by Minister Erica Poilat, as well as our super fun Safer Sex and Safer Injection Kit Party spearheaded by our own Kim Kelly. And here to reflect on that time, and its legacy is Judson member Ted Dawson, who has been involved with Bailey House since its founding and has been on its board of directors for over 20 years. So embodying sanctuary can mean opening your doors and heart, even in the face of fear, death, and dismissal, and choosing to save lives. And show us how, Ted. Thank you, Micah. Um... Judson has always opened its doors to the LGBTQ community, as you know, and has been a real sanctuary for all of us. Never more so, though, than in the early 80s, 1981, 1982, when the AIDS epidemic hit this, hit this city so vehemently. At that time, uh, Judson Howard Moody was the senior minister, and Lee Hancock was his associate. Now, Lee was very involved in in the, particularly the gay men in the Judson congregation who were suffering and seeing people around them just passing right and left. In 1983, she attended one of the very first city hall meetings convened by Mayor Koch, then Mayor Koch, and spoke there. And she made a big impression on a number of AIDS activists in the, in the audience, several of whom later went up to her and asked her who she was and would she get involved in their, in their cause? And she said she would. These particular men, they were all men mostly at that time, were particularly focused on the number of AIDS men in particular who were being thrown out of their apartments onto the street by their landlords with no place to go. She attended uh, several meetings in their apartments. It later went to basements and some of the more uh, other places around the village. And at one point she said, let's meet at Judson Memorial Church. And that is to me the epitome of sanctuary. So these gay men 
mostly gay men then met at Justin Memorial Church and formed what later became the AIDS Resource Center. It, it was actually established there at Judson Memorial Church. In the beginning, there was a, what we called a fishbowl that went to Sheridan Square to take up donations, uh, to, to find apartments for these people who were thrown on the streets. At these meetings, the first AIDS vigil in Central Park was organized. Now, at the time, it was the very first one. It was a candlelight visual. It got very, very widespread national attention and wide attention throughout, throughout the state and the city. Reverend Hancock spoke there. She was interviewed by Pill Moyers, and she, she got on 60 Minutes. That propelled what then became ARC into the, into the spotlight of many of the AIDS organizations. From there, uh, the AIDS Resource Center opened what was it is now Bailey House, which was a vacant hotel on the west on the west side near Christopher Street. From there, that was the very first congregate housing in the in the nation for people with AIDS, and it all was because of the sanctuary that Judson provided. Now, what you're seeing on the screen are portraits. They're from a man named David Johnson, who many of you know at Judson. David was not an AIDS activist at the time, but he began to go to some meetings at Judson Memorial Church. David was one of the very first employees at Bailey House. He was there for five years in the very beginning. He literally ran the place and he put Bailey House on its feet to do what it had to do. He also was an artist, as you can see. And he decided to take portraits, to paint portraits of all of the very first residents at Bailey House, all of, all of who have now passed away, who died in Bailey House. As many of you know, we have recently installed many of those portraits in the gallery in the basement of Bailey, in the first floor of Bailey House, and they're there, and we brought them home, thanks to David. And as long as people go into that space and see those portraits and read David's bio on the wall, they associate and know what Judson Memorial Church did for the foundation of Bailey House and for the establishment across the country as Bailey House was a role model for supportive housing across the country. We recently um, merged with Housing Works and to this day we've, we, take care of hundreds and hundreds of hundreds, we house hundreds and hundreds of people in our facilities every year and tens of thousands over the years we have been able to, we've been able to, to house. So um, thank you, Judson Memorial Church for myself, for, for my fellow board members and particularly for the present clients, but mostly for the, and the past clients for, allowing us to live dignified lives. And thank you for, for that initial sanctuary that got us going, for the inspiration to do so, and for the gift of life you gave us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ted. And accompaniment comes in many different forms. And Judson's idea of accompaniment greatly expanded in 2007 with the founding of the New Sanctuary Coalition, an immigrant-led immigrant justice organization that still calls Judson their home. And here to tell us a personal story about the continuing fight for immigrant justice is Janice Hossein. Janice is an entrepreneur and graphic designer who became an advocate for immigrants held in detention while fighting for her husband's freedom. Janice has served on the staff at the New Sanctuary Coalition and continues to fight for immigrant justice, using her own experience with her husband's fight to empower those fighting their own struggles against ICE and the U.S. immigration system. So embodying sanctuary can mean sheltering the neighbors that our government most dehumanizes and allowing them to lead us. Show us how, Janice. Well, for me, sanctuary is a safe space. I call my home my sanctuary. Unfortunately, 
for a period of time, home didn't feel safe. Immigration and Customs Enforcement in 2015, um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, also known as ICE, in 2015, raided our home and detained my husband. My husband was held in immigration detention for a year and a half. Eventually he was released and placed on an ankle monitor. Six months later, he was detained at an ICE check-in. He was again released a month later. At the end of 2017, my husband received a pardon from the governor and got his green card back. While I was fighting for my husband, I met other families separated by detention and deportation. Approximately one year into our fight, I met Ravi, the executive director of New Sanctuary Coalition. New Sanctuary Coalition, for those um, that has never been to New Sanctuary's office, it's based inside of Judson Memorial Church, an immigrant rights organization fighting to keep families together. The first time I entered Judson, I went alone to discuss what my family was experiencing and what they were facing. And I left that space knowing that I was not gonna fight ICE alone. I had an entire community beside me. I didn't understand how important it was for immigrants to have a connection to sanctuary spaces until my family was faced with the threats of deportation. My time at New Sanctuary Coalition shed light on how houses of worship plays a role to keep immigrant families safe from being kidnapped by ICE. When there's an ICE raid, a non-citizen is not safe in their own home. Judson serves as a space that opens its doors to provide that safety for those at risk. Before the pandemic, New Sanctuary Coalition held a weekly clinic with over 100 non-citizens in attendance. For years, the clinic was held at Judson where all non-citizens gathered to work on their asylum applications, work permits, and to gather with family members of loved ones detained. There were times that members didn't need to work on any of those applications, but they attended the clinic because it was just a safe space to gather. As we wait for things to get back to normal and can gather again, the pressure to keep sanctuary spaces safe has to continue. We cannot depend on elected officials to keep our community safe. We keep our community safe. I am forever grateful for the new Sanctuary Coalition and the Judson community that stood beside us and stood beside many like us. Thank you so much, Janice. And now we move into the second decade of the 21st century, which started with a bang as the Occupy Wall Street movement took over public spaces, demanding economic justice and demanding attention for the 99%. And here to give us a bit of that history is Reverend Michael Ellick, who served at Judson during the time of Occupy and was instrumental in spearheading Judson's work with Occupy and the development of its offshoot, Occupy Faith. So embodying sanctuary can mean demanding equity, jubilee, and radical change in economic policy. Show us how, Reverend Michael. Sure, that'd be great. Um... Well, in one way, I think um, Judson was literally a sanctuary to the Occupy movement. When um, everyone got kicked out of Zuccotti Park, Judson's assembly hall and every stairwell were the place where everyone went to reconvene. And it would, because it was seen as an ally to so many people in a safe space. But, but um, speaking in this kind of broader way, uh, figuratively, you know, I think of Judson as growing out of that um, prophetic tradition of Christianity, where you know the the spirit of the depths bubbles up from us, and we are called into this right deeper relationship with ourselves, the deepest part of ourselves, and each other, and with creation. And that can be a really scary process, both to um, our egos and to the empire and to the wider church as well. So, so many of the ways in which Judson has been functioning as a sanctuary, which we've heard a lot about, that was all at play at this Occupy moment they wanted me to talk about today. And um, there's so much more uh, here to, to get into, but to keep it to three minutes, I promised Christine three minutes. Um, there was a Judson member, is a Judson member, Stephen Duncombe, uh, who, with the School of Creative Activism, who used to really encourage us to think about 
not just um, uh, protests, but demonstrations in the true sense of that word, that we're going to demonstrate a different reality and uh, offer people a way to see it and to create a porthole to enter into it. And, and a lot of the workshops with that is where this singular image emerged. And a lot of this kind of thinking was cooking in a ferment of creativity and theology and, and activism. But this image uh, that could share a whole story at a glance, this idea that capitalism has become this sort of false idol, um, was amazing in its own way, but what's really amazing is a community of people who will hold it aloft and walk down the streets of Manhattan. And that had some, um, that rippled out in the collective imagination. And it's really what uh, made it possible for churches to get involved. In the beginning, per churches wanted nothing to do with this. This was like a messy rupture from the collective uh, unconscious. So in a lot of ways, um, this, uh, revealed not just um, a tactical win, but it also, I think, revitalized churches to say that they have these deep liberating powers in their tradition, and um, it changed everything um, overnight. Um, so Judson safeguards not just literally people, but these traditions where we're allowed to go deep and to reimagine what the world can be, and that uh, I will be grateful for for the rest of my life. All right. Three minutes. Thank you so much, Michael. And as with Occupy Faith, multi-faith dialogue has always been an essential part of how Judson embodies its own faith. Judson partners with sacred communities that challenge us and co-create with us. And one of those relationships is with the astonishingly creative community of Labshul. And Labshul is an everybody friendly, artist-driven, God-optional, experimental community for sacred Jewish gatherings based in New York City and reaching the world. And they have made ritual and sacred space with Judson for several years now, and the relationship just keeps growing. So embodying sanctuary can mean building multi-faith bridges in order to create epically essential new forms of beloved community. So show us how, Amihai and Naomi. Love, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be living. Same. Hello, I'm Amichal Alavi, founding rabbi of the Lab Shul community and a dear friend of the Judson community. There's a verse in scriptures in the book of the wilderness, the book of Numbers. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob, your sanctuaries, Israel. It is a blessing bestowed by a one-eyed prophet upon the people of Israel on their way to their promised land. And what begins as a curse ends up as a blessing. He looks at that beautiful camp of people with all the complexities and says, I see beauty where others see other things. That verse is also about transformation. What begins as a tent becomes a sanctuary. The Jacob who begins his life as a troubled youth wrestles his way to become the God wrestler, the Israel of our shared ancestry. And I'm thinking of this verse as I think about the sanctuary at Judson where so many times in my life and my community's life these last many years, we have entered and we have transformed and wrestled with so much that needed us to rise together. On the steps of Judson, we created sanctuary on the day after the Pulse shooting. Inside the sanctuary, we co-created sacred space to rise up for pride, for Black Lives Matter, for the treasures of fusing Jewish and Christian, human and progressive, and to create sanctuary as we are called to evolve. Deep gratitude to the Judson leadership community, deep souls, for helping us have a home and for together wrestling to make this city 
country and world a place of greater sanctuary for all in need of dignity, justice, love, and peace. May our journey continue often and often together. Reverend Derek and Shira, take us home. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. I said this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And you know what? The world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. This joy that I have, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy, yeah. This joy. Thank you so much, dear Lab Shul friends. And any church that wishes to truly actively embody sanctuary must always keep its heart open to change from the inside out. And Judson has spent the last few years approaching its own historical and continuing whiteness through a variety of programs, creating both spaces to move toward anti-racism and spaces for our Black, queer, and other marginalized voices to craft sanctuary for themselves within our walls. And Reverend Michael J. Crumpler served as Judson's moderator, and during that tenure, he founded the People's Judson, a sacred service for Black, queer, and other marginalized members of Judson to build worship, art, and activist space together. And Reverend Crumpler also works as the LGBTQ and Multicultural Programs Director at the Unitarian Universalist Association. And that work has helped him to make the People's Judson into a new kind of sanctuary at Judson. So embodying sanctuary can mean looking to the margins to see who is being left out, who needs to claim their space, who can teach us more about ourselves and our untapped collective potential. And show us how, Michael. Wow, thank you, Micah. Um, as I was considering what I would say tonight, I, I, um, I came up with the phrase, Judson has justice in its bones. And when you are seeking sanctuary, you want a place <laughs> that already like embodies that for other folks. I think that the intersections of, of, um, of Harbor you know, are, are, are very important. It's important to see how other people have been cared for throughout the, the history of an institution. And um, when I came to New York City in 2013 to attend Union, I like to say that I came to, 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 to Union to go to New York. Um, in need of a sanctuary, I, I found Judson. Um, what I mean by that is that, you know, what I mean by justice in its bones um, is that social justice is embodied in the constitution of Jud Judson, as we've already learned. And as a Black, queer, aspiring minister living with HIV, I knew I'd be hard pressed to find a liberal progressive church that would disciple me into ministry um, uh, that also privileged my values. Uh, but I also knew that if I were to trust any church, uh, um, you know, to be Black affirming and queer accepting, it needed to have the kind of history that Judson has. And, um, and I found that to be true because, because of these three initiatives that Micah named that, uh, was able, that I was able to lead during my tenure as moderator, uh, ungendering the bathrooms, leading difficult conversations around uh, race under the theme of white love listens and creating brave space for people of color and marginalized identities uh, known as the People's Judson, which, which Micah also mentioned. Um, Judson with its justice bones uh, uh, had, had already created a spiritual infrastructure for what has uh, caused, which, for what would have caused many churches to have become undone. Uh, for example, um, 10 years ago, uh, or maybe now a little more than 10 years ago, the restrooms had already been ungendered in their infrastructure. 
uh, when the building was um, prophetically, had prophetically eliminated its urinals in anticipation of a day when all bodies would share the same space, whether one stands or sits. And um, so when it came time to rename the restrooms, as I would like to say, uh, it, was a, it was a soft lift. Um, it was a lift, but it was a soft lift. <laughs> um, and we were able to do that because of the history. Um, White Love Listed became a space to hear the pain and power and promise of people of color whereby whiteness uh, became willing to listen first in order to learn and heal. The phrase implies, if you love me, then listen to me. But if you can't, you can't love me if you refuse to listen to me and hear me. And then finally, um, in the Trump era, those of us who move in bodies that are at risk and under attack realized, uh, and who remembers of Justin, <laughs> realized that we needed more than just, you know, the, 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 the common space to be together. Uh, so we created the People's Judson, which was a space for us to connect, for us to eat, for us to sing, for us to, to, to dance and to organize and just to be together instead of being lost in a sea of, of ordinary. And, um, and, and only a place like Judson with its sanctuary history and its justice bones uh, mm -hmm. could allow for such uh, power and, and safety and, um, and really like, you know, love. And so uh, for that reason, uh, Justin has been and will always be my sanctuary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Michael. And just as the People's Judson creates specific sacred space, another initiative has brought power and transformation into the walls of Judson, nudging our space and our people toward future visions that call us to question the boring binaries to which we so often cling, even at Judson. And Judson has been blessed to house trans Bible study for several years now, and its quiet queer power is changing Judson from the inside out. So here to give us a glimpse of that power is Rachel Tenney, who is an educator, a longtime member of Judson, and a founding member of Trans Bible Study. So embodying sanctuary can mean carving out space to reclaim sacred stories and transform them into new stories in radically hopeful ways. And show us how, Rachel. Hi, my name's Rachel and I'm a member of trans and gender non-conforming and non-binary and intersex Bible study. We're the only Bible study we've ever found expressly made by and for people of the trans experience. I want to acknowledge that we gather tonight on the eve of Trans Day of Remembrance. I give thanks to my trans family that makes my existence possible. I hold the 36 known trans people who have been murdered in the United States thus far in 2020. I hope my words about trans community are a blessing to their memories. Judson is our home and we started meeting in 2017 after this amazing text exchange between Hannah and Miles. Miles, will you share info about the trans Bible study you were talking about? I would love to go sometime, Hannah replies. I don't know of such a Bible study, that would be awesome, Miles. Oh, I got confused. Maybe we should start one. We could do it at Judson or if small at my apartment. Judson did offer a space to become a group of folks sharing about our faiths and exploring where we felt represented in religious writings. We talk about everything from rebirth and renaming in the New Testament to confronting translations of Genesis that made us feel included. Some months we had a theme to explore or a guest leader while other months we read texts from beyond the traditional canon even considering a speech by Sylvia Rivera as our own canonical text. We were able to reclaim communion, sharing foods and drinks that represented our own bodies, bodies that rarely found sanctuary in religious community. We joined with a group from Lab Shul to decipher rabbinical teachings and welcome visitors from across the boroughs and even from across the world. As we celebrated a year together, we created a zine, each choosing to share some part of how important Bible study was to us. I want to share with you now some images of our zine. This is our cover with a beautiful queer Jesus as sketched by Jason and the back cover collage with items we'd shared in communion. Elvis asked, what would lesbian Jesus do? 
to help us expand from our patriarchal understandings of God. I dug into how I felt reading The Thunder Perfect Mind, a text contemporary to the Christian Bible's writing, which calls to a God of many genders in ways that specifically break down all binaries. As you can see, I got into the L word style relationships map here. This is just a selection of the zine, but I want to end now with these words from their piece, Placeholder, because I think they sum up what sanctuary means to our group. Then one day you walk into a room of strangers. Introductions start and you fumble to explain your namelessness. Feeling awkward, you apologize. You quickly realize that your apologies aren't needed. They welcome you wholeheartedly. After all, they understand the naming journey. They've never known your old name. So you feel seen. They offer you a place to belong just as you are. To know you, they are willing to share in the tensions you feel. That day, the burden of namelessness feels more manageable. Thank you, Trans Bible Study. And thank you, Judson, for proclaiming your welcome on your message board and in your saving our first Friday of the month in the assembly hall. Thank you for sanctuary. Thank you so much, Rachel. Queer Jesus forever. And whoo, what? A history. And we've almost come to the end of this evening, but we haven't even come close to naming all of the current and future ways that Judson can continue embodying sanctuary. And I want to tell you about two final new initiatives that have blossomed over the past year, both responding to the racial justice uprisings that have swept across our city and country. As protests against police brutality and in support of the Black Lives Matter movement filled the streets this past spring, Judson responded by creating a new program called Protester Sanctuary, offering safe, police-free space for activists seeking sanctuary, escaping police escalation, or just needing snacks, restroom, and company. In tandem, Judson Arts Wednesday's artist Steph Reed founded the Power of Love Project, through which he offers mutual aid services to activists in the streets and micro grants to organizers in need of financial support. And through these two initiatives, Judson continues to carry the living history of embodied sanctuary at Judson into the future. And I'm about to turn things over to the amazing Steph because the Power of Love Project is not only an initiative, but it's also a powerful song that's going to send us off into the rest of our night. And Steph Reed hails from Brooklyn and is a warrior for social justice, a billboard charting songwriting producer and Grammy nominated music educator. But before I hand it over to Steph, I just want to thank our beautiful tapestry this amazing collage of activists, artists, artivists, organizers, faith leaders, storytellers, without you and your commitment, sanctuary would just be a word. It would just be a place. But with your embodiment, we are creating the sanctuaries we wish to see in the world. And we have enough walls in this world. So be a sanctuary instead. We want to thank Greenwich Village Historic Preservation Society, especially Ariel, and thank you all for joining us. And of course, all of these initiatives need more people, more energy, more resources. So if you are excited by what you've heard tonight, head on over to judson.org slash preservation. We are a hardworking building and community and hardworking buildings and communities can use cold hard cash as well as warm engaged hearts and minds. So come find the place where your gifts can be well used and let's embody sanctuary together. And if you are inspired tonight, we welcome you to type into the chat box what your idea of embodying sanctuary is. We want to see that. We want to hear your voice and we'll share all of those juicy ideas tomorrow when you'll receive an email from us giving you all kinds of ways that you can participate in embodying sanctuary with Judson. So look 
out for that email, don't delete it, and come contribute to all the ways that Judson tries to spread the power of love and come embody sanctuary with all of us. And speaking of the power of love, embodying sanctuary can mean something as simply profound as believing in the radically hopeful power of love. So Steph, take it away. Oh my God, Michael, thank you so much. Uh, shout out to my Judson family, Jaw family, shout out to Michelle. Uh, yo, I'm, shout out to my family, my mom and my brother who's, a, who's in the chat and watching right now. Um, yeah, we've been doing so much just powerful things in the community and it, it means a lot to me to be able to leverage my, you know, my God-given gift of music and my passion for humanity to, to, to help make the world a better place. Um, we've been giving micro grants twice a month to two different um, by POC women to help make their work sustainable, um, protest relief, uh, to give people masks and water and snacks and like sanitizer so they can make their activism sustainable. We did voter registration concerts this last October to get people out to go out and vote and use, again, leveraging just the, the power of music to bring people together and then to just insert that, that message of like empowerment, which is like the pill and the peanut butter. And like, we're gearing up to do a lot more work, vision board parties, as well as um, songwriting and social justice classes, which is teaching the next generation how to be art of this and to, 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 to process their thoughts and emotions about the world around them and teaching them the, the, the building blocks of making songs and then kind of leading them into creating their, their protest anthems and their social justice songs. And so that's the work we're doing. And in collaboration with Judson Memorial Church, I hope that you guys are inspired and moved to want to support this movement because we can't do it without you. Um, so anyways, thank you so much for the opportunity to share my message and the initiative. And I um, hope you guys will join me on this next song it's called The Power of Love from which all this started. All right, here we go. Y'all hear me good? I believe in the power of love. I believe in the power of love. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh. I believe. It's the match that sparks the flame. It's the action that inspires change. Power to the people in this holy war. And no weapon formed against it shall prosper. out the dark it's the dream of freedom that martin taught
We're fighting these conditions. The world is ours to live in, and we can't let it fall. No, no bands, no borders. We're breaking down that wall. They can't divide us all if we I believe in the power of love. I believe in the power of love. Oh, 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 Everybody, unmute your mics. I believe in the power of love. This is happening. Everybody sing. I believe in the power of love. Everybody, unmute your mics. I believe in the power of love. One more time, sing. In the power of love. I believe, I believe in the power of love. I believe in the power of love. I believe, I believe, I believe power of love. I believe in the power of love. Make some noise. <laughs> Let me feel it. Let me hear it. <laughs> Give it to me. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh, that felt so good <laughs> thank you all so 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 very much um i know that i i know that i speak for everyone at village preservation just in saying that we have so much gratitude for the architecture the community the arts the culture the energy that judson brings to greenwich village it it is a gift. Um, you are all gifts. Thank you so, so, so very much. Um, thank you to everyone who has been here with us this evening. Um, there will be much information coming your way uh, tomorrow. So please keep an eye out for that. That's going to come from, from us at Village Preservation. So definitely keep an eye out. And thank you all again so much. Um, I'm so, I'm just so delighted to share this space with you. So have a great, great evening, everyone. Um, and take very, very good care of you and of yours. So good night. Good night. <laughs> Thank you, Ariel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> did amazing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Everybody smile. I'm going to take a screenshot. Barbara, <laughs> are you there? Barbara Moore, are you there? Barbara? Jill! No, okay, I'll, I'll um, Photoshop her and smile. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Thank you.